Good evening and welcome to the, the presentation of, um, of this new um, book, which is uh, produced jointly by the International Center for Monetary and Banking Studies and CEPR, and has been edited by Angel Ubide, <coughs> Christine Forbes, and Bill English. And, uh, and this evening, uh, Angel will uh, give a presentation of the book. And, um, and then there will be a discussion by Charlie Bean and Catherine Mann. Uh, so I'm, I'm Ugo Panizza. I'm here, I guess, with two hats. One hat as director of, the, of ICMB, the International Center for Monetary Banking Studies, which is a small think tank based in Geneva. And this is vice president of CPR. So this is a joint production. So keeping both hats. Uh, I, let me just start by thanking Angel. Christine and Bill, this is a fantastic book. If you just, uh, there are copies there. If you just look at the list of authors, you'll get impressed. And this is the second book they, Angel, Christine and Bill did, uh, did one about the uh, central bank's reaction to, to the COVID shock. And this is from to the inflation that follow after the reaction to the COVID shock. Um, but I, I just, just gonna take two minutes and then I'm gonna give the, the floor to Angel. But, uh, you know, we all remember 2021 was kind of things were going well, uh, you know, vaccines were being deployed. There was some optimism and, uh, and then mid 2021 inflation started going up and started going up. And we started seeing inflation levels, which we hadn't seen, uh, I'm older, so I remember the 1970s, but people who don't remember the 1970s, they hadn't seen inflation at that level, at, at least in advanced economies. And, and this really tested central banks and you know, tested, number one, their resolve to, uh, to be serious about inflation, but also you know, tested whether the, 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 the monetary policy framework that they had in mind um, worked. Uh, so, so the book, it's very rich again, it does uh, a lot of amazing contribution. But one interesting thing, it has um, seven points, seven conclusions. And when I was reading the seven points, uh, seven lessons, I guess, that's, that's how the authors put it. And um, I, I'm just gonna pick uh, two of them. The first one that we need to improve our ability to forecast inflation. But that's not easy. So I used to teach uh, macroeconometrics, and when I would teach forecasting, I say, you know, Niels Bohr once said, making prediction is hard, especially about the future. And then there are, you know, the, 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 the first law of forecasting is that give them a forecast or give them a date, never give them a forecast and a date at the same time. So, so, so that's, a, that's a lesson, but that's, you know, that's a tough one. And then two points, uh, I, I, actually, I'm going to say three things. Two points, which are uh, point five, and lesson five, and lesson six, which is the importance of the interaction uh, between monetary and fiscal policy and the risk to go back to fiscal dominance. And, and that's, uh, so, so one of the things that ICMB does, it produces together with CPR, the Geneva report, Three years ago, we had a nice Geneva report co-authored by uh, Agnès Benassi, which since then moved to the Bank de France, Giancarlo Corsetti, Corsetti Javier de Brun, and Elga Barsh, which was exactly on how uh, can we rethink about uh, monetary policy and fiscal policy living together. So, you know, people went to school in the 90s, at least, there was this idea that we would think about the two separately, but it's more and more important to uh, think about them together. And the third interesting thing, and that reminds me of when I was an undergrad in the 80s, now we call it the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s, uh, which we were taught this stuff that again, I was, not, I was taught as an undergrad, but not as in graduate school, that was this idea of the asymmetry of monetary policy, right? That monetary policy is very effective in tightening, is less effective in, in, uh, uh, when you have to, to, to stimulate the economy. And again, there is something here about the book that says, you know, interest rate, are probably the right way to go when you want to tighten, uh, more complicated when you want to relax, when you want to uh, ease. But let me stop here. So Angel will, uh, will, will present the book, and then we'll have this discussion by, by Charlie and, uh, and Catherine.
and then, then we'll uh, we'll open it for discussion. I'll... That's quicker. Oh, so I don't need this. Yeah. Oh, good. Brilliant. Good. And this one. All right. Okay. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, Hugo. And thank you, everybody, for, for coming here. As I was listening to Hugo, I realized that um, I did co author with Hugo the Geneva Report in 2019, and the title was Inflation and the Great Recession. Then, um, in 2021, um, uh, we did the first of the volumes uh, here of monetary policy and central banking in the COVID era when the worry was about uh, deflation. And then, uh, you know, action and then reaction. And hopefully this is the end of the process, right? And we are not going to have to do any more books because there are not going to be any more shocks. And now we had to do the book about monetary policy responses to the, to the post-pandemic inflation. So what I'm going to do is <clears throat> I'm going to tell you the story that we tried to tell in the summary introductory chapter with a little bit of a sprinkles of some of the results of some of the, um, of the other charters in the book. So what is the headline? The headline is this was a big surprise and the surprise was global. Those two things, okay? What you have in these charts is the different evolutions of the wheel forecast starting in 2021 in January, which is obviously the lowest one and ending in the one in October, 2022, over there for advanced economies, over here for emerging markets and developing economies. So what do you see in these two charts if you didn't know what happened over the last couple of years? You see, there was a surprise and the surprise happened in two steps, right? The first forecasting mistake that goes all the way to the October, 2021 wheel, and then the second forecasting mistake that goes all the way to the October 2022 wheel. And it happens similarly in both places, in advanced economies and in emerging markets. So to me, this is exhibit A to say that it was global, it was a surprise, and nobody saw it coming at the beginning of 2021. Then, what are the surprises and why the two steps? By now we know. Right? The first one was a very large global supply shock. Here, the chart on the right is the New York Fed uh, index of supply chain pressure. One thing I realized when looking at the comparison with the chart on your left, which is uh, world consumer price inflation from the IMF database, is that you can see that the moments when inflation picks up is the moments when there are supply shocks. Hmm? which is 2000, 2007, 2009, if you remember, there was a commodity price spike, and then in 2020 to 2022. So when, when it's demand shocks, inflation is reasonably stable. When you have the spikes and the volatility is when there are supply shocks. And that is what we happen. And in this case, as you all remember, this was global, right? The second thing that happened was, and we all know, it was a very large energy shock. I should have added a couple of more words. It was large, it was broad-based, and it hit all commodities in the spectrum, which is different from the 70s. So if you look in the 70s, the dotted red line, which is energy, goes off the chart, right? Here, it doesn't go off the chart, but there is much more density on the upper part of it. And this is very important. There is a chart missing in this slide, as I presented it the other day, I realized, which is, the price of electricity and natural gas did not increase back then, and it increased now. Why is that relevant? Because that goes straight into core inflation, because we all use electricity. And that's a different type then of energy or commodities shock. But it was large, and it was common. Then, is it really true? So. This is the only piece of the econometrics that I'm going to show you. So what we did, we calculated the first principal component of headline and core inflation for the whole sample of countries. And then we divided into advanced economies and emerging economies. 
for the sample period before 2019, and then the period after 2020 to 2023. And what do you see? You see that in all cases, the dark blue bar is higher than the light blue bar. Basically double the size, which essentially means that the common component of headline and core inflation is double the size in the second period than in the first. That's what the first principal component suggests, right? So again, it could have been an unhappy coincidence, right? That every single country in the world got an idiosyncratic shock at the same time and of similar magnitude, but that's quite unlikely. So the more likely sort of explanation is that this was a global shock and it affected both headline and core. So this is sort of setting the stage of what happened. Now, in some countries, especially outside the United States, this was amplified by the exchange rates. So if you look at the chart on your left, that's the BIS uh, index of, uh, of the broad uh, exchange rate index in real terms. And you can see that there is a very rapid appreciation of the dollar, right? Which essentially means all the other countries that are on the other side of the dollar were suffering a depreciation, which in some cases was quite rapid and quite threatening to inflation expectations in those countries. And that determined to a very large extent, in many cases, what central bankers uh, did. Now, this is the global story. But obviously, you know, as the saying goes, all families are unhappy, but they are unhappy in different ways, right? So all countries suffer the inflationary shock. But it's quite striking when you look at this chart, the differences in the level. So what this chart shows, the bar is core, the dots is headline, and that's the peak in the inflation rates from the beginning of the shock to today. Switzerland, around 2% core, Sweden, around 12% core. It's not that inflation expectations were at different levels in those places. Is that something happened that allowed those divergences, right? In the Eurozone, and it's not here in the chart, in France, inflation peaked at 6%. In some of the Baltics, it peaked over 20%. And they had the same inflation expectations and the same monetary policy. So there were divergences here. And these are things that uh, we also discuss. Now, the composition of inflation was also different. And this is a summary from the chapter that uh, Olivier Blanchard and Ben Bernanke wrote for the volume, right? There is a lot of stuff here, so ignore it completely. Just think of colors. This is the historical decomposition of inflation for the US, United Kingdom, Eurozone, and Japan since, nine, since 2019, decomposed on different factors, okay? The colors in Japan are blue which means it was mostly food prices. Hmm? The colors in the US are much more red, which is slack. The same thing happens in the United Kingdom. The colors in the Eurozone have a combination of some, but it has a lot of yellow, which is the shortages, because the Eurozone is more open to international trade. So it's an interesting chapter because you can see the differences, but also the similarities across. And they have now also a collection of 11 working papers that get into a lot of detail about uh, what happened and why. All right, so what did central banks do facing this? Well, they also, they have a common strategy as I will explain, but they also have their divergences. So what do I show in this chart? This is countries ordered chronologically by the timing of the first interest rate increase. So the first one was Turkey, the last one was Switzerland. What the bars and the dots show is the level of core inflation and headline inflation at the time of the first interest rate increase. So for example, when Brazil started increasing interest rates, core inflation was barely 2% and headline was around five. When the United States started increasing interest rate, core inflation was six and headline was close to 
This is interesting because if you look at the chronology, it's emerging market first, developing economies second, right? And there are two perhaps intuitive reasons. The first one is in advanced economies, there was more confidence about the stability of inflation expectations, right? And second, probably the emerging economies were being hit by a bigger global shock because they are more open. And so in some sense, there were lots of divergences, but you cannot tell from this that countries were right or wrong. Simplemented, they were doing these things uh, at different times. So how did they do it? What was common across all the different central banks? So there were three stages of tightening, right? This is the map, then follow. First one is the, what's happening here. We need to move. So raise rates quickly towards a restrictive level to anchor inflation expectations. That's what every single central bank did the moment they realized that inflation was accelerating. Now, they were faced with a problem that is, wow, we keep on chasing a neutral rate, and it seems to be higher, right? Because the economy was not slowing down as they thought it was going to slow down. Right? I can tell you that in the middle of 2021, there wasn't a single central bank I was talking to who thought they were going to raise rates much more than a couple of hundred basis points. Because that was the experience of the previous 20 years. And what they realized now is that they kept on increasing rates and that's why they had to accelerate the pace of interest rate increases because they were realizing that they were not getting traction and the target was higher than they thought. And that explains why a lot of central banks started slowly and then they accelerated. The second point was, okay, now that we think we are sort of there, let's fine tune to a level that's sufficiently restrictive, whatever sufficiently means, right? And they got into a debate, as uh, Hugh Peel uh, put in a speech, of whether you adopt a table mountain strategy or the mother form, right? Table mountain meaning, I'm going to hold you tight enough for long enough, hoping I don't break anything along the way. The mother form is, I'm just going to hike as much as I need to, I don't care what breaks. That was a debate. Different people had different views. And then the third step, which is where we are now, that is holding rates at sufficiently restrictive levels for long enough to be confident. See, these are all clauses that are important that inflation will return to that. That's where we are now. The question is what does confident means? Do you need a slowdown in economic activity or not? So this is basically the map exposed that they all follow. Now, did they get a little help from your friends, as the Beatles would say, right? Well, fiscal policy did help, although it also was lucky. These charts are from the contribution that uh, um, Pierre Olivier Guinchas and his uh, colleagues from the IMF Research Department did for the volume, where they study the impact of fiscal policy measures on headline inflation in the Eurozone. So the chart on the left, the red line, is what they think inflation would have been without the fiscal measures. The fiscal measures were price caps and subsidies. The blue line is actual inflation, and then the projections of the wheel. Right? So what it shows there is that in their calculations, thanks to the fiscal policy actions, which, by the way, increased the deficit. So it was a case of expansionary fiscal policy reducing inflation. Thanks to that, inflation was better handled and inflation expectations probably were anchored at a better level than otherwise. Now, if you remember what those fiscal policy measures were, they were open-ended, right? It was price caps, which essentially is selling an option to the world. So they were lucky because commodity prices did stop increasing soon enough, right? Because if they have continued increasing, which is what they show in this chart on the right, alternative scenario with energy prices staying high, then the effect of support to demand starts mattering more. And so you can see that the dotted lines show a higher profile for inflation with uh, the fiscal measures. So the message here is that 
you know, do not hesitate to ask for help to your fiscal policy colleagues, but it needs to be well designed and you need to be careful about it. There was another debate, right? That is where the central bank lived, right? As I showed you before, some of them started raising rates when inflation was already very high. And some people were arguing that the reason inflation was so high was because, for example, the Fed had waited too long to raise rates. So the point we try to make here, and we are obviously not original in saying this, is that, well, it is not when you start raising rates, it's where the level of financial conditions are by the time you raise rates, right? And so what you have here is the blue line is the Fed funds rate, the, two year, the red line is the two year rate. The same chart can be made for basically every country. So by the time the Fed started raising rates, most of the tightening along the yield curve had already happened. So you can argue that central banks were late, it's fine, but you have to have a better argument than this one. And there are others, right, that people can use. So one way to look at it is at the outcomes. Were they late? Well, you know, as Sumo was saying, never trust a forecast, but I'm going to use a forecast to make my point, <laughs> which is, this is the latest way of forecast for the CPI inflation in advanced economies and in emerging markets. And it looks that, well, it doesn't really look like they were too late, right? In all of the cases, what you get is inflation returning to the target. Yes, over time, but after all, that's what the balanced policy rule would also tell you to do, right? So it doesn't look like once we look at the performance of inflation, it doesn't look they were late or too late. I guess. It also doesn't look like if looking at inflation expectations. Now, I qualify that. This is a chart that comes from the contribution by Roberto Perli and co-authors in the book. This is just the five-year, five-year forward break-even. And I put it here because it's very interesting for one reason. What inflation expectations did was to rebound from levels that were too low. So the initial worry about the anchoring of inflation expectations wasn't really about the level. It was about the speed. Of course, we're supposed to get worried when it's going up so fast. But exposed and at the end of the story, if now is the end of the story, what we achieved was to re-anchor inflation expectations at more or less the right level. So one could tell the story, this was a successful exercise in opportunistic reflation. There is a positive shock in inflation. You take advantage of it. You re-anchor expectations where you want them. And then you luckily move on from that. Of course, this wasn't done by design but uh, it's not a bad story to tell. Yes, I know in the UK, this chart doesn't look as good and in other places, but I want to put this as an example. In the Eurozone, it's also um, similar to this. Now, the really good news is that uh, all this has happened with little damage to the labor market. Remember the discussions we were having at the beginning of 2021, that it was going to be necessary to generate a massive recession to stabilize everything, right? Well, it didn't really happen. So what this chart shows you is unemployment rates at the beginning and at the end of the process. And as you can see, in most of the cases, the lines slow down or are basically flat. And remember in 2019, we had some of the lowest unemployment rates we had ever seen. If you had told the ECB that they were going to achieve all this lowering the unemployment rate along the way, they would have not believed you for one second. So it hasn't been that bad. Now, the key word is obviously so far. Okay? So I'm qualifying my forecast here, but I think it's important to recognize. Now, if you read the chapter that Claire Lombardelli wrote for us for the volume, what is really interesting is the behavior of real wages, which is the red bars in this chart. So remember, we spent the last three years discussing that labor markets were very, 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 very tight. And they were one of the key reasons why inflation could become permanent. And there could be second round effects. Now, for the second round effects to really happen, these red bars should have been positive more than negative, right? And what we have here 
is that despite the tightness in labor markets, what you get on the chart on the left is uh, the historical perspective of unemployment rates versus history, right? The, the bars are the history. The blue diamond is where we are today. And in most of the places, the blue diamond is at the bottom, right? So what is really surprising, and I think we need to think about this, is why are these two charts happening at the same time? So one answer could be, there is more to the story. Come back to me in three years, and you will see how the red bars are higher. Sure, maybe. Hmm? But the reality is that this is a reasonably good outcome, given what happened. All right, I'm almost there. Obviously, it would have been better if rates hadn't had to increase so much, right? This is Claudio Borio's chapter in the book. And he highlights all the risks that we are going to face with higher interest rates, including you know, the increase in the debt service ratio, the potential impact on house prices, and everything else. And of course, we had several episodes in the last couple of years of financial instability. So clearly, there was a cost to all this process. Right? Now, what did we learn? These are the seven lessons that Hugo was talking about. The first one, forecasting inflation is difficult, but it's difficult in cases when both supply and demand move at the same time. And this is really important. And that's what we saw at the beginning in one of the charts, right? So be mindful, we are in a world today where supply is moving both domestically and internationally with all the geostrategic changes and everything. Second point, stop talking about looking through supply shocks. That leads to the transitory versus permanent debate and is kind of useless for the analysis. What is important is think about what policies you want and put it at the right level. The transitory team never said you won't raise rates because rates were at zero. The debate between transitory and permanent was how much damage do you need to do to the economy to stabilize inflation? Right? So it's not a question about just simply looking through supply chains. Third thing we learn, interest rates are the tool to tighten policy. Ignore the balance sheet has been completely sidelined. You may agree or disagree was the right thing to do, but that is the lesson. Fourth point, you must use forward guidance when you are at the zero lower bound, but use it in a smart way and explain it. In other words, Use it in a smart way. So use state contingent conditions. And then explain that sometimes you will have to break the forward guidance for the right reason, and that's fine. So what happened in Australia with the RBA, for example, is an example of this, right? They used YCC. It was useful at the beginning. They didn't explain properly that if one day they need to break it, it's fine because that's success. And maybe they could have designed it in a better way. But don't throw the baby with the bathwater here. Five, embrace fiscal policy, as Hugo was saying. I used to say at the beginning, you know, several years ago, that inflation wasn't a monetary phenomenon. It was a monetary policy phenomenon. Now I say inflation is an economic policy phenomenon. It's a matter of all policies working together. There is nothing wrong with central bankers talking to the rest of the authorities, right? provided they all do their job. Six, beware of the debt sustainability dynamics and what it may do to the pressure that central banks will be under. And I'm not going to say how to solve that problem because I don't know how to solve that problem. Seven, plan for financial stability if you want to be able to manage price stability better. For example, think about standing liquidity windows or standing facilities that in a situation in which you need to raise rates very quickly, will keep your financial system stable. So the Fed, when SVB collapsed, had to create a new facility. Maybe they learn a lesson there, and I'm not saying they should have a similar facility, but maybe think about the provision of liquidity and the terms. Final points, and I finish here. This is from Charlie Evans. Uh, this. Thinking about the future, and given that the review of monetary policy frameworks is coming across central banks, three things to think about. The first one, we used to worry a lot about RSTAR being very low. So do we have policy frameworks now that are also robust 
to hire a star? Question mark. Second, do we need to update the way we think about flexible average inflation targeting or the inflation of yet? And then third, should the last mile be symmetric? And by the last mile, I mean central bankers are telling us we need to lower inflation all the way to 2% in a timely manner. Is it the same thing to steady it at 2.1 or 1.9 or not? And if not, why? And I'll leave it here. Thank you. Well, thanks very much for the opportunity to come. Um, I guess uh, because it's being launched here in the book, uh, that's why uh, I get to be here too. Okay. Turned it off. Now it's on? Yes. Yes. All right. Great. Uh, so let me give you some uh, perspectives from the central banker side of the equation. Um, and I'll look at both um, the US uh, euro area and the United Kingdom in comparison. And then I'm going to focus in a little bit more on the UK. So um, I'm going to start, actually, let me start with, there are going to be three things I'm going to talk about that are with reference to the seven lessons that um, are in the book. I think they're lessons to me as a central banker. Um, I'm only going to talk about three of them. Um, the first one is that I think it's really important to understand the linkage between the policy rate and financial conditions. Um, and there tends to be a uh, very extensive focus on the dynamics of the policy rate um, of an individual economy, uh, when in fact what matters for the conduct of inflation dynamics and for the real economy is financial conditions uh, for which uh, people like me don't have a lot of control. So I'm not. I'm not saying I'm not responsible uh, for anything, but I'm just saying I'm not the only player in the room. Uh, the second point that um, I think is extremely important and for which the broad brush of the book makes it very difficult to do it all in detail is if we want to understand inflation dynamics, um, and I'm going to focus on this in particular for the UK, uh, it's incredibly important to look under the hood or under the bonnet. Um, disaggregation is critical, microdata is critical, regional data is critical, and um, in some sense, the effort to forecast headline inflation is doomed to be incorrect because of changing uh, flows underneath the hood. The third point is that um, I want to emphasize and I will show you a chart that will show this. I want to emphasize the critical need to understand the supply side. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then the fourth point that I've already sort of already mentioned, but I want to come back to it again, is understanding the global components of inflation versus the domestic components of inflation and being pretty... Uh, alert to when those switch or are on the point of switching. Okay, so let's look at um, our first point. Um, so here we have our policy rates. Um, you know, we have the uh, UK in purple, US in uh, aqua, Euro area in orange. And if you want to know why we have these colors, it's because these are the current colors of the currency that you might have in your pocket. I don't know about you, I don't carry it anymore, but that's why we have these colors. I just think it's important to note that it wasn't my choice. Uh, so what do we take away from this chart? Um, we did start earlier than anybody else, a little bit, um, but in the end, we took a more cautious path. The MPC as a majority rules type of committee took a more cautious path for raising the policy rate. Uh, now, it was the case that inflation was already rising um, about the time I uh, took my first vote in um, September of 21. I did vote with the committee at that point, but I soon started to diverge 
uh, in 2022 for a more hawkish stance. Question is, why did I do that back then? Um, I had looked at the research that was being done by the staff uh, on um, what were the implications about uncertainty about inflation, which is both the uh, model relating uh, shocks uh, to the real economy, but also if you didn't actually understand if the data itself were murky. So two different kinds of uncertainty. Both of those uh, research agendas would, uh, would have suggested to go forward and be more aggressive in terms of the hikes. And these are things that I talked about extensively in my speeches in 2022. Um, now it looks like, if you look at this chart, there's been you know, a really dramatic uh, amount of tightening, um, uh, 500 and some odd basis points, uh, pretty much for everybody. Uh, but I think we have to um, look uh, a little bit more at what this translates into in terms of financial conditions. And that's what this chart does. Now, there are lots of different kinds of financial conditions that one can find um, on the internet or other places. These happen to be ones that we calculate internally. Um, and I think the, the point to be made here, and actually um, Anhal made it in his presentation as well, looking at the policy rate for the Fed and the two-year uh, treasury yield, you can see by the dates along the bottom that the markets were way ahead of the central banks in terms of, of their tightening. And in fact, pull forward a lot of the tightening that ultimately would be put into, into the market. Um, that's kind of, one could say, the good news. Um, the, the question that I think is important to think about is um, after, you know, the, the tightening cycle continued for quite some time uh, after the financial conditions already started to ease. And so that's a, it's, a, it's an interesting challenge for the central bank if it wants to continue on, or it believes is appropriate, to continue on with policy restrictiveness uh, and the financial markets don't agree. Um, and so there's a global component to this uh, that is an important ingredient in um, the, uh, what we see here. Um, the other aspect that I think is important to consider is when we think about the implications of uh, both the policy rate and about financial conditions, it's important to think about whether or not it's the deltas that matter or the levels. Um, and I, I haven't been at, you know, at, at Citibank for a while, um, uh, I think there's a, a room for thinking about that in, in more detail now that we have some big deltas and some high levels. Now, these, of course, are the nominal things. Um, and for any, uh, and, their, and their aggregate uh, financial conditions, and in keeping with the notion that one needs to be disaggregated and one needs to take account of individual country uh, institutional experiences, it would be appropriate to decompose each one of these into the components that matter the most for the transmission of monetary policy. For example, in the UK, we would tend to emphasize the mortgages and the exchange rate. Um, in other countries, there might be a much greater role for equity markets, um, uh, but that's, that's not here. All right, now what does this translate into the combination of the policy rate change and the financial conditions to uh, UK real rates. So uh, um, the uh, uh, point here about how the markets were uh, ahead of us as uh, central bankers, I think that's shown here. Um, on the other hand, there are a couple of other aspects to this chart that I think are worthy of, of emphasis. Um, the first one is, is that um, the, uh, Let's see, the first one is, is that we started from a very uh, negative um, real rate. So there was, a lot of, uh, there was a lot of adjustment that needed to be done to get to normalization of real rates. And so the real kind of interesting part of this chart, which is, you know, okay, we had a lot of QE, there was an effective lower bound, there was a negative real rates, 
the kind of more interesting part of this chart is, is uh, in uh, the latter half of 2002 and 2003, which is uh, the time period where we started to talk about restrictiveness um, in our communications. And um, at, the, at the middle of 2023, which is sort of our peak, right, peak there, um, that was uh, uh, when we started talking about restrictiveness. The question um, to uh, consider as we move forward into 2024, where you can see we uh, got uh, closer to the zero line there, um, is what is our star? And if our star has changed, then there is a question about how restrictive we are using these measures of the real rate. So I'd like to turn now to talking about the second point, which is understanding inflation dynamics by looking at disaggregated uh, aspects. So this is a, a, a chart that I've used before um, when looking at, try, uh, at the sort of the UK situation relative to the US and the Euro area. Um, and I start by making the observation that uh, we have uh, a significant gap between goods, services, and headline inflation in all of the economies. But in the UK, it's relatively larger than others. Um, so that starts to set up the question that we've had in our analysis as to uh, when can we expect uh, services inflation to start to moderate. Now, the US PCE is, is also a kind of an interesting example here um, of the gap between services and goods, but I'm going to focus on the UK. The way I approached looking at this issue about services and goods inflation, um, I spent a fair amount of time looking at this uh, issue in the, context, in the context of a speech I gave at OMFIF, so you can look at that for even more detail. But to understand how close we might be to a more normal relationship between goods and services, what I've done is look at these two um, series relative to the averages over the historical experience, which is the dotted lines. So if there is this historical relationship between service inflation running at about three and a quarter, three and a half, and goods or goods inflation uh, actually being negative at about negative 0.5, uh, then looking at the year over year, which is on the left-hand side, we have a long way to go on both of them, right? We're nowhere near the historical kind of relationship between services and goods that is consistent with headline at two. Now, if we look at the three month over three month, we look pretty good on core goods, right? Um, getting into the neighborhood for services, but there's some question marks about both of these. Um, on the good side in particular, uh, we have to have a durable uh, deceleration of goods to like deflationary territory in a durable way. Now, on the one hand, we might have that happening uh, as China tries to um, boost its exports uh, through um, China price. On the other hand, um, Red Sea issues, um, global fragmentation issues, um, rebound in real incomes in the UK, uh, ongoing concerns about uh, additional costs that need to be integrated into trade at the border, these are all factors that would tend to bolster core goods and have it deviate from its deflationary historical experience. So there's some concern there. Uh, now, in the OMFIF speech, I can also, I also show, you, show you some very disaggregated CPI level data. But in any case, the last uh, piece of evidence that I want to uh, bring forward uh, to emphasize the need to understand the dynamics of core goods and services, and then even getting deeper below, below each of these, 
These are some uh, BVARs that we have uh, produced in order to understand what the forecast for CPI services and CPI goods would need to be in order for our forecast of achieving 2% headline in the medium term. So uh, if we are to get to that forecast, which was in the last monetary policy report from about three, three months ago, uh, three weeks ago. If we are to achieve that, then the conditional forecasts for these two categories have to look like what you see here. Um, the data obviously are in the colors and then the forecast is in the white line and then the, uh, around that forecast. Now core goods, I said, I had some questions and marks about the near term and that is that um, a uh, little bit of a pickup uh, associated with the positive skew that we put into our forecast associated with primarily Red Sea. Now for services, the deceleration in services has to continue throughout the forecast horizon at a much faster pace than what we've uh, seen. So our services forecast um, the conditional forecast of what services price inflation would need to be in order to get to our forecast of 2% headline um, looks aggressive, especially considering our other uh, information that we have through our other types of um, uh, decomposition exercises, uh, uh, neural Phillips curve and so forth that I've talked about before in, in other speeches. So I'd like to move now to my third topic, which is the supply side. So this is a chart that I've used in uh, slightly different uh, versions of it, but I think it emphasizes the degree to which the United Kingdom's supply side has deviated dramatically from what we observe in the two other economies that I'm using as reference points here. Um, our, uh, our own estimated potential supply, and I say that our own because with Charlie sitting there from OBR, this is not exactly what theirs looks like. Um, uh, I, I don't know how it looks like. Good for you. <laughs> um, but you can see the dramatic deterioration in the estimated potential supply for the United Kingdom. Um, where does this come from? It comes from a variety of uh, sources. Principally, however, labor force participation rate in the UK has not recovered to its pre-COVID rate, whereas for the US and the Euro area, they are above the pre-COVID labor force participation rates. So that is uh, a very significant uh, issue. We have talked about it in our monetary policy reports more than once. Uh, there's also the issue um, having to do with uh, productivity growth as well as slack business investment. So it's really across the board. Uh, and then we could throw in some things about fiscal uh, as well. I'm not gonna talk about that, however. Now, what does this translate into when we think about uh, the implications for UK? So we have a, a decomposition methodology that can uh, divide the dynamics of core inflation into these four components, uh, domestic supply, domestic demand, global factors and uh, additional factors that we have coming through the uh, currency. Um, and you can see the historical experience about that. But what I want you to focus on is the most recent data. Um, and it really gives you a handle on one, just how important the deterioration in the supply side is for the UK in terms of driving core inflation. Number two, the switch from the global factors driving core inflation in the UK in the 2021 and 2022 period to where we are now in 2023 and going forward, it is domestic, domestic demand, which includes uh, a monetary policy component. And then number three, the extent to which previous appreciations of the, of the uh, sterling get translated into uh, depreciations, which add to additional inflationary pressures. So to conclude, the lessons that I learn um, is 
first, you know, we have to uh, mind the gaps. That was the name of the speech at um, fifth. In other words, evaluating inflation dynamics via a bottom-up assessment. Can't get away from that anymore. We got plenty of micro data, no excuses. Number two, uh, take a walk on the wild side, uh, which is the supply side. These are comments that I made at National Association for Business Economics Policy Conference in Washington um, uh, a few weeks ago. You can, if you you can get it uh, on YouTube video. Uh, number three, under financial conditions diverge from the policy rates. Uh, so looking at policy rate alone is is uh, a mistake. I'll just leave it at that. It's a mistake. And that levels and deltas both matter. Um, and thinking about how they matter and for which part of the monetary policy transmission mechanism is particularly important. On this last point, which is where uh, Anhal ended his, his, uh, his own uh, seven lessons, um, I'm going to be a little bit different. Uh, and, and I'm going to base this uh, last lesson learned um, you can read about it in the business economics uh, fireside chat that I had with Christina Romer and Diane Swank uh, at uh, the NAEP uh, uh, annual meeting in Dallas in November. And uh, I took the opportunity there to comment that effective macro prudential frees monetary policy to focus on inflation. The better is your macro prudential in other words, robustness of your financial structure to shocks, the better is effective micro prudential, the more monetary policy can focus on inflation. Thank you. Okay, I don't have slides, so how do I, um, there we are, leave, leave you with Britannia. Um, <laughs> Okay, uh, it's been a very uh, challenging time for central bankers. I thought it was pretty tough when I was there, particularly uh, once the financial cri crisis hit halfway through my 14 years at the bank. Uh, but I think one has to be honest that the challenges central bankers have uh, been facing over the past uh, half two years, not just those, uh, the challenges that we grappled with uh, into a hat, which seen some really big shocks. Um, but of course, one of the nice things about big shocks, as far as economists are concerned, is it helps us figure out how e uh, economies work. That's what we like. Big shocks uh, is a way to dig into the mechanisms um, underneath. Um, now, as uh, Angel uh, said in his introductory remarks, really the story here is primarily of two shocks coming in sequence. Uh, the first, the supply chain problems post-pandemic uh, during the uh, recovery from the uh, pandemic. Uh, and that was largely a common shock and is relevant to inflation in 2021 and the first part of 2022, I guess. Uh, then uh, we have the energy and food price spike that was associated uh, with the invasion uh, of the Ukraine. Um, that, again, is a common shock, but it was more geographically concentrated in some of its consequences, particularly uh, Europe relative to, say, the uh, United States. Uh, and that's uh, more relevant, obviously, to the way inflation has developed uh, from the middle of 2022 onwards. Now, both shocks have uh, proved to be largely transitory, uh, with the latter being uh, larger uh, and lasting somewhat longer. Uh, but from the point of view of central bankers having to take policy decisions, a key question uh, as both of these shocks hit, uh, was the strength of persistence and amplification mechanisms uh, that would kick in in the wake of the shocks. Um, and here, I think I'll single out three particular channels. Uh, so the first is um, the input-output matrix of the economy. So uh, shocks in energy and food rippling through 
uh, into other sectors. And that's a sort of largely mechanical uh, process that you can get a handle on through the input output coefficients. Uh, but the other two channels are more behavioral. The first of which was inflation expectations and central bankers placed a lot of weight uh, on the importance of keeping inflation expectations anchored. And I think that's entirely right, I should say. Uh, but my third channel, uh, which was very important back in the 70s, and I should say, I'm a real old fogey, not like Hugo. Uh, so I started my professional career as a forecaster in the Treasury in 1975. So I was grappling with it first time round. Um, and uh, what we used to call real wage resistance, uh, was important then. Um, so the reluctance of workers to accept the necessary fall in li living standards in the wake of an external terms of trade shock. Um, and one thing I did sort of diagnose from some of the central bank commentary this time around was not really worrying too much about that, that the nature of labor markets had changed, more focus on what was going on in goods markets rather than labor markets, which maybe is a reflection of the way the academic literature has gone where the new Keynesian model focuses all the action on uh, goods and services market, output markets rather than the labor market. Uh, but uh, for me, um, you know, I thought that um, real wage resistance was potentially also an important channel. Uh, and it should also be said the cyclical position uh, of economies, including uh, the policy stance, uh, was potentially important. And I think it helps to explain some of the uh, critical differences uh, between uh, different jurisdictions. Uh, now, as far as the first episode is concerned, the uh, post-pandemic recovery, uh, I have to say my take is that uh, policy was generally kept expansionary too long. Uh, in particular, I couldn't really understand why central banks were pursuing large-scale asset purchases through 2021. Uh, eminent sense in 2020 when there was the instability in uh, financial markets, uh, but it was less obvious why it was justified uh, later on in the pandemic, if you think about the effect of a pandemic, it screwed down on both demand and supply, but it doesn't obviously open up uh, an output gap. So it's not obviously an aggregate demand uh, management argument uh, for it. Uh, that said, um, it's probably true that it didn't do much uh, macroeconomic damage, much inflation damage because I think the empirical evidence suggests that the impact of quantitative easing when markets are functioning reasonably well is actually quite weak, whereas it's much stronger uh, in dysfunctional settings. Um, but what I think, though, is also true, which um, possibly plays into why <laughs> central banks were slower raising their policy rates when market rates were already rising, the fact that market rates were rising well in advance actually suggests that the delay in raising policy rates didn't do too much damage. But I think one of the, uh, the drivers of this was the, the general low for long mindset that central bankers had got into. Uh, and in the case of the Fed codified in the flexible average inflation targeting, uh, which was introduced uh, shortly before the uh, pandemic um, and potentially could have been counterproductive by leaving the inflation objective uh, somewhat fuzzier. Uh, and also suggestions that the Fed would wait until it actually saw inflation being manifest uh, before acting. Uh, so I do think we learned, learned something about the potential problems with the uh, policy framework, particularly in the US, but other countries, I think, also had vestiges of uh, worrying about how can we put enough demand into the economy and that will there be enough demand when we come out 
uh, of the pandemic, whereas the reality turned out to be there was plenty of demand uh, and it was supply uh, problems that were more of an issue. Uh, moving on to the, the second episode with the energy and food price spike, uh, here, I think um, the differences between the jurisdictions uh, are notable, and um, uh, Catherine's already uh, picked up on this. So my, my diagnosis really is that in the US, uh, much more of the story was associated with uh, a standard cyclical overheating. Uh, you had expansionary monetary uh, and fiscal policies uh, coupled, at least for a while, with some restriction in supply because of the so-called Great Retirement, although that subsequently uh, unwound. And importantly, the energy and food price spike for the U.S. is not an external term for trade shock. The U.S. is a net energy producer, it's a big food producer, and so forth. So really, the challenge of dealing with it is an internal distributional that's very different to Europe, uh, which are net energy and food importers in general, uh, and we're suffering uh, an external terms of trade shock, which requires a fall in uh, real living standards. Uh, now, in the Euro area, that's exactly what it was, uh, a pretty classic terms of trade shock, difficult to, uh, to manage, but um, Pretty clean. Um, the size of the shop a bit different across different countries. The UK, and this is something I think uh, Catherine uh, uh, exposed, which I agree with. I mean, the UK, we had the worst of both worlds. So we not only had uh, the energy and food price shock, and it's worth saying the energy shock here is actually a little bit larger. Uh, because the way the gas market works and so forth. Um, but we also had a degree of overheating driven not by excessive demand growth, excessively expansionary demand policies, but because of uh, uh, failures on the supply side, and in particular, the withdrawal of half a million people from the labour force uh, as a result of the pandemic, only some of which has come back and we've also seen very weak productivity growth because investment has been depressed. Uh, and of course, there's the Brexit effect uh, laid on top of that as well. Uh, so for, for um, my uh, Bank of England former colleagues, um, you know, there has been a, an extremely uh, challenging context. Now, lessons. Um, I talked about the three propagation and amplification mechanisms, potentially the input output stuff. Um, I don't really want to uh, talk much about to say that's largely mechanical, uh, but inflation expectations turned out to be the dog that very largely didn't bark. In fact, this angle suggested actually there was a slightly helpful uh, movement up from below where you wanted them to uh, round about where you wanted them. Um, so, uh, the dog that didn't bark. Uh, I have started to see suggestions in some quarters that, oh, the fact that inflation has come down and inflation expectations remain accurate, all suggest that um, uh, central banks overreacted by raising rates, uh, what's well, really quite aggressively, about 400 to 500 basis points uh, within the space of about a year or so. Um, now, that may be true, but I'll bet if they hadn't raised policy rates, you would have seen very different behavior of inflation expectations. But it would be nice, uh, I think, to try and uh, tease that out uh, more formally. Uh, but my guess is that without aggressive action in the face of a big uh, pickup inflation, you wouldn't have seen inflation expectations remaining anchored in quite the same way, so that central banks couldn't have just looked through this shock in the same way as, say, the MPC, uh, when I was on it, looked through the inflation shock in 2008, when inflation got up to 5% just before the collapse of Lehman's because of 
uh, uh, rising oil prices. And then a couple of years later, we had another uh, spike in inflation in parts associated with the imposition of uh, a higher level of VAT. In both cases, we say we said these are temporary shops. We're looking through them and didn't tighten policy. Uh, I think this time around, it would have been, um, uh, let's say, a bold move if central banks had chosen uh, not to tighten policy to a degree. Uh, on the real wage resistance transmission mechanism, um, I think there's a bit more there in at least some jurisdictions, and particularly the United Kingdom, than perhaps some of the commentary in the book suggests, and particularly the Bernanke uh, Blanchard uh, chapter. Uh, you know, I think if you look at what's happening in the UK, where we've got pay growth running at around 6%, as opposed to something nearer 4% or even sub 4% in the US uh, and the Euro area, and the rhetoric around why uh, pay is running at that sort of number, settlements this year seem to be coming in around about 5%. That's two percentage points higher than is consistent with uh, meeting the inflation on a cons uh, the inflation target on a consistent basis. So there is, uh, I think, uh, uh, an issue there which has to be addressed. Now we may see pay growth coming down. Uh, now headline inflation uh, has been coming down, and it's likely to be near the target from the uh, spring. Uh, but I would emphasize that this episode is not over yet, uh, and it's perhaps a little early to be declaring victory. I think the other thing that's worth mentioning in connection to this particular channel is also the importance of the pretty massive fiscal support that uh, most European countries uh, gave to their households, and that will help to have um, dampened some of the pressure higher pay. Uh, now, what about uh, things for the future? I'm picking up on a few themes. Uh, the first of these is with the R star. Uh, is R star going to stay higher? Or is it going to go back uh, to where we were um, through most of the past 15 years since the financial crisis? Um, I have to say, uh, you know, I think there's plenty of reasons to expect the equilibrium will uh, rate of interest uh, to have risen. Um, the demographics are pushing in the direction of greater relative labor scarcity, baby boomers moving into retirement and starting to save. Uh, potentially, we uh, may see a, a burst of investment in many countries. Uh, to deal with the challenges of climate change uh, and also uh, to exploit the possibility of artificial intelligence. So, you know, even if you buy the standard secular stagnation story of Larry Summers, I think there's reason for thinking that next equilibrium uh, would, uh, would rise. Uh, I have to say, uh, on top of that, um, I've never found the secular stagnation hypothesis completely convincing for the simple reason if the story was all about the savings investment balance you should have seen the same decline in the expected returns on risky assets and broadly speaking they've been pretty flat they're, they're harder to get measures on but you know you can do it in different uh, ways uh, my colleague at LSE Ricardo Reese has a, uh, a recent paper that comes to the about eight different approaches and the, the big picture is it basically pretty flat and a big part of the story of the decline in the safe rate of interest appears to be uh, a rise in the equity risk premium if you want to call it that or an increase in the convenience yield on uh, safe assets uh, whatever but it's something i don't think we we ever fully understood in the first place uh, and it's quite plausible that it um, uh, it may not stay where it was uh, before the current inflation episode. So, you know, my bet would be we'll be living in a world of a higher half style than we were. 
The good news from that, central bankers, is it takes us back into a more normal monetary policy world where your primary policy instrument will be a short-term interest rate. You don't hit the lower bound very often, uh, only in extreme cases. Uh, and we can go back to something that's uh, much more comfortable and accustomed. The bad news, of course, though, is for the guys down the end of the road in Whitehall, uh, because it worsens the fiscal constraints, uh, and of course in other countries uh, as well. Um, and um, uh, given that uh, many governments haven't really even recognised the challenges that they're already facing and have uh, fiscal uh, plans which are on unsustainable paths, that effectively includes the UK and, uh, and the US, uh, but also uh, some others, uh, further essentially exacerbating the environment that they're faced with by having an increase in R minus G uh, does make for a volatile uh, fiscal uh, context going forward and possibly increased political pressures uh, on central banks. Um, so, um, staying with fiscal, um, the, we've got more challenges. On top of that, uh, the financial crisis, the pandemic, uh, and now the response to the uh, price spike associated uh, with the Ukraine, they've all prompted large-scale fiscal intervention. Uh, and that's increased public expectation the governments are going to sort of step in as an insurer of last resort. Uh, now, that's okay in principle, actually quite a sensible thing to do, uh, just like uh, governments share the burdens of fighting wars over time, borrow and future generations pay. You can argue you should do the same when you get these uh, nasty adverse tail shocks. Uh, but there is a quid pro quo for this, uh, and that's that um, fiscal policy, uh, that um, governments need to be much more aggressive in building in fiscal space during the good times. And uh, I think we have let, yet to see governments really recognizing uh, that. Uh, so this is going to add to those fiscal uh, pressures that, uh, that I uh, talked about a moment ago. Uh, back to central bankers, ditch forward guidance, at least time-dependent forward guidance. Maybe it was a necessary evil uh, during the period when we were at the effective low bound. Um, but, um, uh, well, Angel, I think it was referred to the experience of Philip Lowe at the RBA. Um, the danger of um, uh, making forward guidance time dependent is you're uh, setting up a hostage to fortune and if it turns out you have to change tack uh, you're going to come in for a lot of criticism and in the case of Phil Lowe it basically cost him his, uh, his job. Um, instead central banks need to uh, focus on explaining their reaction functions. What, what is the information they're looking at how they're going to respond to it, things like that, and get away from saying, well, we might cut interest rates in our June meeting uh, or, or whatever, which uh, strikes me as uh, unnecessary and potentially foolish. Uh, my final comments are on financial stability, uh, or financial instability, I suppose. Uh, this is another dog that so far largely hasn't barked. Now, I, I think if you ask most central bankers two years ago uh, about what the likely impact of four to 500 basis point rise in interest rates accomplished in the space of about a year or so, um, uh, they would say, well, that's pretty likely to generate uh, some uh, nasty financial uh, instability. Events. Most probably in the murkier corners of the financial markets. Um, now, what problems there have been 
which is, I guess, the UK uh, LDI crisis about 18 months ago, uh, and then the US regional banks collapse of uh, Silicon Valley banks almost exactly a year ago. Uh, they were both cases where the problem was hiding in plain sight uh, in what really plain vanilla parts of the system and just speak to very bad risk management on the part of both institutions and uh, probably also the relevant regulators. But I think still hanging over us uh, is a question of whether there's other problems yet to surface. Uh, assuming the rise in yields is sustained, uh, especially commercial real estate, uh, which seems a, a good candidate, possibly private equity. We have, of course, seen problems in China uh, with real estate uh, companies, and people have been expecting that in some senses for a while. Uh, but I think uh, an open question is whether we may see similar problems emerging in other jurisdictions in years to come. Uh, and I will stop there.